Good morning. I don't think I'm going to be teaching anything that, like, you all haven't heard before, but I think sometimes God wants to remind me of certain truths, so he has me volunteer to teach, and then I learn a lot. <laughs> um, so, um, first, though, I have something I have to give away. Um, who here likes Snickers bars? Anybody like Snickers bars? Yeah, okay, there's a few hands. I, I saw Gabriel a couple times, so uh, Gabriel, I got I got a little gift for you. Then here you go. You're welcome. All right. Oh, and um, I also saw Joanne's hand up. Can I see your hand up, Joanne, for that? Yes. So I want I want everybody to see. I've got a Snickers bar for Joanne as well. There you go. All right. Yeah. Okay, got that out of the way. Now, let's, uh, let's jump right in with the scripture. Um, I'm going to have us bring up Matthew 20, verses 1 through 15. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man that is a, land, is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, or about a day's wages, he sent them out into his vineyard. Then later on in the day, it says about the third hour, he saw some others standing idle in the marketplace. And he's like, you, come on, work in my vineyard, and I'll give you whatever is right uh, to you. And then later on at the sixth hour, about halfway through the day, and ninth hour is getting later through the day, and... It says about the 11th hour he went out and found others standing idle. So it's like, we're running out of sunlight here, but he grabs these people that have about like one more hour to work and said, why you've been standing idle here all day? And they said to him, well, because no one has hired us. He's like, well, come work in my vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers, give them their wages beginning with the last of the first. And those who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. They received a full day's wages for that hour that they worked. And so when, and then he went on through the line paying people that he had hired last to the people he hired at the start. So when those people he had hired initially came, they're already thinking about how much maybe they should get compared to what he gave those other people. So when the first came, they supposed they would receive more, but likewise, each received a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men worked only one hour, but you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered and said to them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me to work for a denarius? Take what's yours and go your way. If I wish to give this last man the same as you, is that not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So Karen Vanderbilt, when she got up, taught about uh, peace. And I remember her asking at one point, like, what can rob us of our peace? And one of the things I was thinking about that I'm going to talk about today is comparison. Comparison can be the thief of our peace, can be the thief of our joy. Um, Gabrielle, if she really likes that Snickers bar, when she saw I gave Joanne a full-size bar, you know, if she was carnal, she might be thinking like, wait, what? Like, I'm getting ripped off here. You know, now Gabrielle probably wouldn't feel like that, which is why I felt kind of comfortable doing that. But that is a <laughs> fleshly very carnal response, and it's, um, and it's something that's in all of us. I mean, you, you, anyone who's like raised kids or been a kid has been like, hey, he got a bigger piece than me. You know, you remember that complaining, that comparison, and that it basically, you know, Gabriel's going to enjoy her candy bar no matter what. But for people that like are bent on that comparison, that can rob them of their, their peace, their joy. I could go out and mow my lawn with pushing around with my mower and feel really good about 
my lawn and go inside and enjoy maybe a cold beverage out of my fridge. And then I look out at the lawn and then I see my neighbor on their riding mower just sitting back comfortable and they've got their beverage holder with their cool beverage right there with them. <laughs> and all of a sudden it's just like, hey. But that's, again, that's a fleshly, that's a carnal response. Um, but we need to be reminded, like that landowner, that God is faithful concerning the promises he made to each of us. He deals with us individually. Each individual, what well, you, like those laborers, he had a contract with them individually, and he didn't take anything from them. He dealt with them fairly, and God deals with us fairly as well. Um, John 21, starting with verse 18, this is after Jesus had uh, risen from the dead, and he had the disciples have the big catch of fish, and he had said to Peter back and forth a few times, feed my sheep, you know, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. But after that time, he was still talking with Peter, and he said, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you when you do not wish. And this he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, he said to him, follow me. And then Peter, turning around, he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved who had also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So that's, that's John he's talking about. John always talks about himself in interesting ways when he he's wrote the book of John. But he was like, looks at John and says, well, but Lord, what about this man? You know, what, what shall this man do? And verse 22, Jesus said to them, if I would, if I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And uh, the saying went out among the disciples, and there was a little confusion. They thought, oh, Jesus said that John's not going to die until he comes back. But John clarified that's not what Jesus said. He said, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Or in New King James, what is that to you? <laughs> um, Jesus was dealing with Peter, and Jesus told Peter a truth. And Peter's like... That was important for him to know, but Peter's like, well, what about John? That's, that's between me and John. That's my deal with John. That's not my deal with you. So, um, again, God deals with each of us individually. And really, we should take great comfort in that fact, that he deals with us individually. That we're not just like a, a, a fraction of a flock of sheep, like, here's all my sheep, let me throw a bunch of food at them and they'll each get like maybe some of it. No, we are each individual sheep to him. We're not a, a dot in a sea of faces to God. He sees each one of us and each one of us are special to him. And we need not worry about how God chooses to bless others. Um, there's um, an evangelism uh, sometimes people say, do you accept God as your, your personal savior? And some people take exception. They don't like that phrase, personal savior, because they think people are putting God in like a box, like, oh, this is my remote, this is my little personal book, and this is my personal savior, like, like God is something that, that we own. But, and when they say that, it means God wants to have a personal relationship with you. Do you have a personal relationship with God? Is he your savior personally? Because he's your savior, he's your savior, he's your savior. You could say, yes, he's our savior, the savior of the world, but he wants to be the savior of you personally. He cares about you as a person. Uh, Psalm 73. It's... I, the more, I, as I studied, I continue to see the theme repeated. You're like, wow, you do say that in a lot of... Make the same point in a lot of different spots in the Bible. Um, Psalm 73, the psalmist was upset a little bit when he started comparing. Uh, verses 1 through 3, he said, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So he looked at what 
the wicked had, and he saw that they were prosperous, and it almost caused him to stumble. But jumping forward to verse 17, he says, Until, until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them in destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation, as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. And then at the end of the, this chapter, the last two verses, starting with verse 27, he said, For indeed those who are far off from you shall perish. You have destroyed those who desert you for harlotry. So those who leave God for the things of the world, they want or lustful for the things of the world. But in verse 28, he says, It is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. So that was his end after it says that he almost stumbled. Why? Because of the comparison. But as he looked at it, he's like, I need to trust in God. I need to declare the good works that God has done. I need to look at what God's done for me. And the, the wicked, whether God prospers them or, and notes that ultimately they'll be destroyed, that was not his concern. I need to trust in God and tell about his works, what he's done for me. Um, but this whole comparing game is not always about like us looking at how maybe other people might have more than us. Um, sometimes we could compare and think maybe we're better than we than others, or we think we're better because we're comparing like what we do, our works, to other people. And uh, we might think we're better off. We might think we're better people, but um, learn that differently too. Um, I want to go to uh, Luke chapter 18, and this is the. Well, it's not a parable. It's a, a, well, it always says this parable. Spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves. And this is of the Pharisee and the publican, or the tax collector. And he spoke to people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. He said, two men went into the temple, one a Pharisee and one a publican, which is a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and he prayed with himself, I, I like that phrase too. He just prayed that this with himself. Um, but he did say, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or, or even like this publican over there. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. And then the tax collector in that same corner of the temple or far, standing far off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven but he beat his breast saying God be merciful to me a sinner and I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself would be exalted the Pharisee was comparing himself to the publican saying, I'm a lot better than this guy or other guys in that camp. But that publican, the tax collector, was just looking at himself and how, who he was to God. And he's like, be merciful to me, God. I'm, I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you. He, it was about him and God. And that was the man who was justified because God had that relationship with him. Um, it can be deceptively easy to think that we are something when we compare ourselves to others as opposed to just looking at where we are with God. And uh, Galatians 6, um, verse 3, um, I know I can fall into that trap too, um, myself of looking at what I do, and I can't do that. I need to, I need to look at what's my standing with God. So Galatians 6, starting with verse 3, If a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work or examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden or his own load. I like New King James. So if I 
try to justify my standing with God. Oh, Jacob has a question. Do we have a Cliffs are mic person today? Or not a question, comment, addition? Jacob. I, uh, I really like what you're talking about, how don't look at others and think, oh, I'm better, and so I'm okay. Um, I had a coworker a few years ago who said they watched a lot of these reality shows about people with strange addictions and things like that, just so that they could feel better about how normal they were and how they've got it all together. Uh, and God hasn't called us to do that. He's called us to examine, like you've shared, like he said in his word, examine your own work. Yes. And if God's called you to a higher standard, don't look at other people and say, oh, I'm okay. Move on to the standard God's called you to go. Exactly, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sure each of us probably has our little strange addictions too. <laughs> there are things that, you know, we do that we think are, this is the way. So, but if I'm looking like at how early I show up to church compared to others um, or how often I show up, that gets me nowhere with God. That doesn't mean a thing to God. I remember uh, Dylan and the character he played in the skit about the, uh, the foolish virgins and we're talking about how to fill your lamp and he was talking about going to church and I've gone to church these times or how many programs he's been in and he was thinking that was the key to, to fill in your cup. But at the end of the day, if we're comparing our works to other people's works and thinking, oh, this is, this is what it takes, we're in danger of becoming like those who said, Lord, Lord, did we not do these things in your name? I did this, I did this, I did this in your name. And he says, I never knew you. I never knew you. I'm, I want that relationship with you. Um, and they were doing and doing for God, but they didn't take the time to, to know God either. Um, one story I don't have, um, we're not going to go through the whole story of the scripture because you all know it pretty well, but it's the story of the prodigal son. And he went off and spent his father's inheritance and wasted it, squandered it, and came back home. And the father took him in and had a feast and killed the fatted calf. And then there was the older brothers like, but... But he, how come he, you're treating him like a king. And I can be that older brother so much. You know, if I could think about how, how long or how well I've been following God all these years, or how well I think I have. And then I look at someone who might be squandering their life um, through uh, drugs, immorality, any of the things the world has to offer. Um, that, you know, we as Christians need to shun. And then at the end of that person's life, maybe God forgives them and takes them home. And the, the fleshly part, the attitude, the older brother part of me would say, God, why do you let them get away with all that? And then I feel that gentle nudge in my spirit. And God says, why do I let you get away? with the things that you have done with your life. And like, uh, well, because God, you're merciful. Bing! <laughs> you know, there it is. You know, yes, God is merciful. He's merciful to us. He's merciful to me, you know, regardless of, of how well um, I've been doing. And so I've got to look at that for me and not compare myself to others. Um, the um, prodigal son story, um, if you look at that in the whole context, he actually told three st stories. That was the third of three stories that he told. He told about the lost coin, the widow with the lost coin, and then the lost sheep where he left the 99, and then what I would like to call the lost son. Lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, and how they had value as they were returned and got, got back and God valued them. But before he told those stories, the people who he was speaking to were the Pharisees. And I apologize, I didn't reread that, but I think they were, I don't know if they were talking about why he was spending time with um, these sinners, with these tax collectors, why he was spending time with these other people. And the Pharisees were bringing these accusations, like you seem to care about these others, folks. And while we've been like, 
working in your temple and working in your word. And that's who he chose to told those three stories with. He was talking to a, a crowd of older brothers when he told that story of the prodigal son because they needed to, to learn that. So, um, Mark 12, verse 41 through 44. Um, again, I was talking about we can't expect the quality or quantity of what we bring to affect, to touch God's heart. Um, Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. And then one poor widow came and threw in uh, two mites. And he called his disciples to him and said, Surely I tell you, this poor woman has put more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. That's what touched God's heart. Not the, not the quantity, but she decided God is worth my livelihood. She went into the temple. She gave that as her service to the Lord, and it was all that she had. And that's what touched God. That's what Jesus noticed. That's what touched his heart. Not the people that were blessed abundantly and gave abundantly, and probably even regularly. Um, so God dealt with that window individually, saw what she was giving, saw her heart in that. So we need to look at that. Each of us look at ourselves. And uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 through 12 says, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to do your own business, work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders that you may not be dependent on anybody. Now, in a New International Version where it says to do your own business, it says you should mind your own business. And I really got a chuckle out of studying this that I, I came across scriptures that said, what is that to you? And mind your own business. <laughs> and I don't want that to be my sermon title. I think we can call it comparison. But yeah, it, it, those, those themes, those kept back. Mind your own business. What is that to you? <laughs> um, but we do need to mind our own business. And that, by doing that, that's how it says that we are going to win the respect of outsiders and not our, yeah, walk honestly towards them that are without, is what, how, verse, how it puts it there. So there are, however, some notable times in the Bible where we are compared or told to compare. And I uh, want to start with uh, Matthew 10, verse 29. And uh, Karen Cook brought out this when she was teaching a little bit. But Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground without your, without your father's will, apart from your father's will? But the very hairs of your head are numbered. And she kind of illustrated that, us trying to count our hair for a little while. But God knows. Fear not, brethren, ye are of more value than to many sparrows. So God does compare us to sparrows and says, you're more valuable to me. And I like how it's in that same verse, that same little section where our hairs are numbered. You are of value to God. You don't have to worry about God taking care of you. He's going to take care of you. He's, he's there. He comes through. He keeps his promises. So if you're going to compare, compare yourself to God compared you to sparrows and said you're more valuable than that. The next verse I want to go to is Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 2 through 4. It says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. That's the comparison. If you want to compare yourself with others, Fine, and then put them up higher than you. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Let not every man look on his own things, but also the things of others. So God says, if you're comparing yourself to others, get it right. Don't, don't say, I'm better than this publican, this tax collector. No, esteem them better than themselves, even if you don't necessarily feel that way in your brain and not yet in a heart. To esteem is to like basically... A, like in accounting, you need to adjust that balance sheet. That's worth more than you, whether you, whether you feel that way or not. So you, you give them that esteem, 
and you look after those things of others. And then, um, and then Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1 through 3, he said, Be followers of me, even as also as I am of Christ. You want to compare yourself to me? Paul says you want to emulate me? It's fine, as long as you do it in the ways that I follow Christ. Now, I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things. Keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. And in verse 3, he said, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And I'm just going to stop right there at that part. The head of every man is Christ. So Paul was saying, yeah, follow me as I follow Christ. But you need to know that Christ is the head of every man. And he, did, he didn't say there, of men. Christ is the head of this group. He said of every man, of this man, of, of that man, of that woman, of that woman. Christ is your head. So really, if you're following me as I follow Christ, then basically you're following Christ, and he almost encourages us, you need to follow Christ for yourself. Um, earlier in that same book to the Corinthians, um, in chapter 3, he talks about um, where people are saying, like, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus. He said, but you are still carnal, for where there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another of Apollos, are you not carnal? So he's saying, yeah, when you're doing that comparison game, you're, you're acting carnal, you're following after your flesh. And think about the, the candy bars. And if it was younger children, you'd know there'd be like a little attitude, like, oh, I'm getting ripped off. Um, and Joanne, you're getting blessed, yes. <laughs> um, Sometimes I think when God calls us children, it's not always a compliment. It's like, it's like, oh, my children. Like you go to the cereal cupboard and there's the box there, but there's no cereal in the box. You're like, oh, my children. <laughs> so when, we, when God sees us doing this fleshly, these carnal games like that we haven't grown up yet, um, and I'm talking to me. <laughs> so... Um, but again, that's being carnal, and that's talking about that envy and strife, and that's all the things that are going to come from confusion. So, uh, all right, I'm going to um, probably pull out my scripture canon and start, like, rapid-fire some verses at you, if Hannah can keep up. So, uh, James 3.16. We'll just ponder while that comes. Okay, for while there, there is envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Well, the envy and the strife come from the comparison. If you're just looking at you and God, there's not going to be any envy. But where the envy and strife is, there's confusion. And there's every evil work. So it's just, there's nothing good that's going to come out of that. And I need to just strip that from my life. Um, all right, question. Well, Hannah gets the next verse up. Who here wants rotten bones? Anybody want rotten bones? Nobody who wants your bones? To rot? Okay. All right. Well, there's a key then. Proverbs 14, verse 30 says, A sound heart is of life to the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. If we are looking at what our neighbor has, and we're like, ah, oh, I wish I had that. I wish I had more. I envy what they have. That's going to rot our bones. We can't dwell on that. We need to have our sound heart, our heart that looks at God and says, thank you for the blessings that you've given me. Um, so what is the remedy? We don't want rotten bones. So uh, the next scripture we have is 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 through 9. But godliness with contentment is a great gain. Godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. So I'm going to pause here and say, if you're envying, you're looking probably at something in this world that somebody has, whether it's their clothes, their car, their lawn. We didn't bring it in. We're not going to take it out. Um, but having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Everybody here is wearing clothes. 
Everybody's going to go to brunch in a few minutes. We need to be content with that and let that be where our focus in. Um, but those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So just like the, um, like the envy and strife lead to all these other things, if you have this desire, it's going to be a snare and it's just going to get worse and worse and draw you in more. Uh, Psalm 23 verse 1, I'm sure you probably all know this without Hannah even having to put it up, but the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, or New American Standard Version says, I shall not be in need. If God is the one who is our shepherd, and again, he knows us as his individual sheep. We don't have any need as we turn to God. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Um, you want uh, to fight against that envy? When you see it in your life, give thanks for the things you have. Um, I had Joshua sing the song before we started, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Give thanks to the Lord. Stop envying those things of this world because it's only going to take you down. It's going to rob your joy. It's going to lead to destruction. And Thanksgiving is coming up in like less than a month, but that shouldn't be like a day or a month. It needs to be a lifestyle of Thanksgiving, and that's going to help protect us from that envy in the comparison game. And one more verse I have, Psalm 136, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Um, we've all been taught enough to know that, um, that God is good, that his mercy is true, and if we keep that our focus, um, then that's going to keep us from that envy. Sue Mulder has her hand up, and she would like to, to add. Um, since uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, died, in my um, in my advertisements has been a, a bunch of pieces um, of information about all the royals and uh, whatever. And um, one thing that I read, even the youngest um, baby is worth like a billion dollars. And I'm, I'm like, um, and I've been looking at all the jewels and the crowns and different things that they have. And it's amazing the amount of, of things that they've, um, um, gathered since uh, 1600s or maybe even um, yeah yeah maybe even earlier than that and I'm you know looking at them and thinking wow that's a, that's quite a thing but I'm just exactly what you said I'm like so what difference is that going to make I if I have all this money but I don't make it into heaven. What yeah. what good is all that money? What good is are all those jewels? What good are are all the the things from this earth if you don't make it into heaven? Exactly. Yes, we need to focus on what's important. That doesn't. Yeah, they can't take. They say you can't take it with you. That's you know from the Bible too. Along with mind your own business. It's funny. You can, like you talk about all the jewels and things. Those are things that have been in the family for decades. So like when you know Prince Harry was born. What did he do to deserve that? Nothing. He was born. He didn't do anything, and he gets all this stuff. And again, it can be easy to envy when you're thinking, well, I, I wish if I was born into that household, it'd be great, wouldn't it? But no, what's great is our eternity with, with him. Thank you. Go ahead, Diane. Um, I have been meditating on um, you know, these kind of things uh, regarding comparison for my own life and looking back, but I just appreciate you use the uh, um, the first scripture about the the workers coming in the field and the time of day they came in and into salvation, because um, that comparison of what uh, your your time on earth, you know, you, you, like you brought it yourself, we could go, oh, Richard's a good guy. He's always done, you know, well. He's you know, his outward life you know, stellar, and then we look at ourselves and go, my gosh, I got, the wheels fell off the cart, got off track. 
<laughs> and uh, you know, someone, someone we might look at and go, my gosh, their life is so messed up. They're living on the streets. What, you know, what the heck? They're way off track. Where is the hope for them? And then towards, you know, any time in life, it's not too late. It's not too late. Never too late. Uh, and and uh, you know, you can still, you know, receive him and get that same reward as someone Absolutely. who stayed on track. And it doesn't take away from the person who stayed on track with God. And uh, right. um, so there's always hope. And then I think of the thing I've meditated on a lot is uh, the, our Father's prayer is, for, forgive us our trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. That measurement, that standard of measure you're referring to, it's like, so basically, the way we're looking at other people and how could they, you know, and then compare it to, well, how much mercy do I want? <laughs> exactly. Yes. I don't want to give as much as I'm receiving. And then the reverse with, you know, I'm doing really great. Look at me. Uh, you know, and look at that person over there. <laughs> um, I, I just, you know, I keep thinking that standard of measure, reversing that. And as much as I want to receive in mercy and salvation and a hope for the future is what I should be looking at for my neighbor. And, and collectively, we should be doing for others. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that comparison game doesn't help us either way if we're looking at like, oh, they're doing so much better. Or um, if I think, like you said, the person that gets saved at the last minute, that could go, I've, I've been, I don't know if I can say this in church, but I've been busting my butt for you, God, <laughs> you know, doing all these things. And this guy hasn't done anything. And you get the same reward. Right. No, it doesn't, it doesn't help me. And it, it and yeah, and that God is merciful. And I got to remember God's merciful to me. Uh, very much so. And, and not look at what, if he, you know, we, I should rejoice in the fact that he's merciful to someone else too. You know, so, Karen. I'm thinking about the humanism, <clears throat> secular humanism is man is the measure of all things. But really the, the yeast, the, the leaven that we carry inside of ourselves is I'm the measure of all things. Because when we're doing that, we're, we're comparing everybody to ourselves as if we have anything of value. Right. So yeah, it's we're really using the wrong measurement. excellent perspective and it's just something you're shining the light on our own thinking because we're, we're doing it. We're yeah. comparing oh, everybody to ourselves yeah. and how empty is that? How yeah, and just as I that? can get up here and teach, it doesn't mean I do it every day. That's really good. As a standard of measurement, we can't use man's things or basically is exalting man above God. It is that humanism to do that. So, Edie. I was thinking about both the prodigal son, the older brother, and also the laborers in the field. Um, on the surface, it doesn't look fair, but then if you think about it, the ones that are coming in last in the prodigal son, they're missing out on a whole lot. Like all that time that they could have served God and had joy in their lives. So, even if like there's a deathbed confession, we're all glad that person goes to heaven, but look at all the years they wasted. Mm -hmm. So we can rejoice instead of comparing and saying, how come, how come? Say, God had mercy on me much earlier in my life and I was able to enjoy these years of serving him. Thank you, yes. And to some of us on the outside, it might look like they're having fun, but if they tell you stories about the things they did in the world, they'll tell you about how empty it was, how there was no satisfaction. Yeah, and they would have yearned to have a life that was turned sooner. So, yeah. Thank you, Edie. Benjamin. I, just to dovetail with what Edie was saying, um, I was thinking of something that uh, Kenneth Hagin said once. He, he was reflecting on that verse in uh, Revelation where it says that uh, God will wipe away all tears, and he was reflecting on that, thinking about how that could be actually some of the tears that... that uh, um, we shed could be when we realize how much we wasted our lives and what we could have had that um, that would be a, a moment of great regret even though we made it in you know maybe by the skin of our teeth maybe we had a fairly fruitful life but that's something that would be can you imagine just thinking about that I just it, it, it blows me away but what I wanted to share is that Paul reiterated that the comparison the foolishness of it in uh, the second letter to the Corinthian church a church which was known for his giftedness, but also for all, a lot of the other weaknesses that befall a lot of us Christians that are growing and at different stages of you know, the immorality and different things. But he said here, 
it, just in the Amplified, it says, we do not have the audacity to put ourselves in the same class or compare ourselves with some who supply testimonials to commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they lack wisdom and behave like fools. And I think about also about, I've read about the healing revivals that happened back in the 40s, and they would have different evangelists and ministers would have tents, and they got into a comparison game of, my tent's bigger than your tent. And some of them even, they would purposely buy a tent that was maybe just so many feet bigger than the others. So they could say, I have the biggest tent on the circuit. It was, well, it's so easy. The devil is so, such a jerk. I mean, he, you know, and our, and our flesh is so corrupt in our hearts. We just, even, you know, we get into this, the comparison, it just runs so deep and we have to really guard our hearts. Yeah, and yeah, when you compare, when you look at, compare your tent like your Paul was saying that, what is the word there? Foolishness? When you like justify yourselves by your, yourselves and what y'all are doing. Yeah. Tracy? Yeah. Um, also, when you're judging yourself justly, you know, and the problem with a lot of people can be that, oh, I'll never be like Richard. I'll never be like, you know, uh, Karen or Jacob or, or, you know, that's, and that is a nut. Also, a, you're, you're losing your, your joy and your peace in that regard because God has, you know, given you life and joy in his, in his spirit and a calling. And, and not, you know, disregarding that is also as bad, you know, and doesn't yeah. give you joy. And God doesn't want you to be like Richard. <laughs> um, he wants that relationship with you. He wants you to be Tracy. He wants to be you to be his Tracy, and, he, and he's yours. And that's, that's why Paul said, sure, follow me, but as I follow Christ. So, thank you. That's all I've got. Okay. Thank you.